This one particularly, I have a lot to say, so bear with me. This was a long-awaited match between what would be amateur boxing rivals. Unfortunately, Gary Russell Jr. fell ill at a rival of the 2008 Beijing Olympics. He was most likely going to face Vasil Lomachenko and would have been the more anticipated matches in that division. Russell claiming he would have beaten him during the build-up. This fight was in the first half of 2014. If you don't know what was happening in 2014 boxing history, there was a boxing network cold war between HBO and their loyal promoters and Showtime PBC with their loyal promoters. Under almost any circumstance, there was never a cross promotion fight where one guy will jump to a network to fight another. Due to the controversy of the Salida Lomachenko fight, Basile had another chance to fight for the title but Gary Russell Jr. was also in line for that belt as well. That year, Abner Mares had the WBC featherweight belt. Russell did not have the popularity at that time, and he would have to go through all sorts of hoops with the WBC to get a fight with Mares, as he was being made the next biggest star. Both guys really wanted this belt. Lomachenko's Ukrainian handlers, who went on a campaign to get Bob Arum to put Vasil in line for a title right at the start of his career, put an incredibly large amount of pressure on Bob Arum to get this fight made, win or lose, if it gets to a purse bid, which top rank lost the purse bid. So this fight was made, and you will see a site that won't be seen till spring of 2015, a cross-promotion fight between a Heyman fighter and a top rank fighter. There were many who were skeptical of Vasil's skills in the ring, and some thought that what you saw against Salido was the best you're going to see from Vasil. The 1-1 one one Lomachenko had a lot to prove against, on paper, the more experienced Gary Russell Jr. with the record of 24-0. The first four rounds, both guys seemed to be feeling each other out. Russell seemed to start a bit faster than Lomachenko, but a rather even fight. In the fifth round, the fight completely changed. Vasil was outclassing Gary. Here's the irony. Lomachenko with much, many fewer professional fights, and yet Russell looks like the amateur style and Lomachenko looks like a pro, correct Polly? The seventh round, Vasil was putting on a masterpiece. Gary was not able to get his footing into the fight, with Vasil winning his first world title and his third professional bout by a questionable majority decision. This was Orlando Salido's third title defense of his WBO title coming off a huge 2012 year, defeating Puerto Rican star Juan Manuel Lopez. This fight was for the WBO and vacant Ring Magazine title. Salido was on a hot streak as he was ranked number one by Ring Magazine, and for the number three ranked Mikey Garcia, this was his biggest test. By far one of Mikey's best performances. Amazing display of skills. Salido didn't know what to do. He put a lot of power. Oh, right hand to the body. And Salido down for a fourth time in the fight. Uh, so he's got one tenant. Content fight come to him. There's another right. The fight came to an end due to a bad headbutt from Salido in the bridge of Mikey's nose to cause issues. Mikey would win by a technical decision. Salido was reported after the fight to have a broken orbital bone. Saha Pram will go in history as one of the greatest, most decorated Muay Thai kickboxers of all time, earning multiple legitimate titles, beating the best in the golden age era of Muay Thai, with well over 100 fights on his resume. This man had a full career, and he was not done yet at the age of 26. He retired from Muay Thai, and he began professional boxing. Due to his credentials in Muay Thai, he was given a title shot for the WBA Bantamweight crown in his fourth professional bout, which he won. He lost the title his following bout against Nana Kanadu of Ghana. Saha Pram slowly crept back up from the WBC and Ring Magazine rankings to where he got another crack at the title against WBC champion and number three in the world, Joichiro Tatsuyoshi. Tatsuyoshi, who is coming off an incredibly close fight with Mexican legend Daniel Zaragoza for the title, then to regain the title to make two successful defenses defeating Jose Sosa and undefeated future Hall of Famer Pauli Ayala. Tatsuyoshi was seen as the favorite to win this fight. Saha Pram proving to the world 
He is not just a great Muay Thai fighter, but a world-class boxer as well, putting his skills on display, shocking many with beautiful fundamentals, amazing timing and defense, completely shutting out Joe Ichiro for 6 rounds straight till he stopped him in the final 10 seconds of that round, to become champion. Sahapram would reign for almost a decade, making 14 defenses of the WBC title to end his reign off with the record of 46-1 before being dethroned. This fight will forever live in controversy against 7-1 underdog Mauricio Herrera. Herrera was giving Garcia so many problems and completely caught him off guard as this was promoted as an easy homecoming match by Showtime. Garcia would escape with a questionable majority decision, which that decision and others would spawn memes of Garcia which Keith Thurman hilariously acknowledged in his post-fight interview after giving Garcia his first loss, which ironically the decision was questionably too close on the scorecards as well in Garcia's favor. I knew when it was split and I heard that widespread that it had to go to me. This is your boy Keith one time Thurman and still champion of the world. One time became two times baby. Ain't no robberies happening tonight. These two had quite of a rivalry in the amateurs. But since not many Westerners follow the lower weight classes, fight fans will only know of Shamim because he was backed by huge investors, Top Rank, and HBO, where they only mentioned him and only him being the best, the future of the flyweight division. With guys like I'm not Ruinong, Roman Gonzalez, Akira Yayagashi, Kazuto Ioka, Francisco Estrada as a class of guys from light fly to flyweight at that time, from what I was seeing from Zhu Shimin as he was coming up, I didn't think he stood a chance against these guys in the pros. I literally called in February, a month before the fight, in a post. I stated how HBO was hyping this man up too much for his own good and has completely alienated the rest of the fighters in the weight class to where boxing fans don't know who the best guys are to where they think this fight will be a walk in the park, a cherry picked matchup, which it isn't. I'm not came in disgracefully as a 6-1 to underdog because how the division was poorly covered to western audiences. Whoever heeded my warning won quite a bit of money, which some folks actually did. I'm not shocked the masses as he put on a show against his rival, fighting an incredibly intelligent fight to win by a wide margin on the scorecards. Hopkins has been written off left and right his whole career. He has one setback, first one in 15 years. The media, the so-called boxing experts, is back on the write-off train to where Hopkins coming into this fight was a 3-1 underdog. But Hopkins is that dude that wants you to write him off and not give him a chance to win. He feeds off that. He fights his best under these circumstances. And Tarver was in for some trouble. Hopkins does what no other boxer was able to do to a prime Tarver and completely shut him out on the scorecards, even knocking him down. Don't give it away. We're gonna finish this heavy. Push him back. We're gonna train it at this, beautiful, beautiful. Hopkins will win by a wide, unanimous decision to become the lineal and WBC light heavyweight champion. Some forgotten history here. Instead of chalking up the loss as maybe he thought he wasn't at his best that night and moved on to bigger endeavors, Tarver comes up with this wild conspiracy that he was poisoned by someone. Now he didn't go as far as throwing some names out there, accusing people like a certain person in recent boxing championship history, but he makes that claim with no evidence to back it up. A more realistic and valid excuse he could have used was he didn't have enough time to lose all that muscle he put on when he starred in the Rocky Balboa film prior to the Hopkins fight. 
Donaire was seen as one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world. Prior to this matchup, he was named Boxing Writers Association of America's Fighter of the Year, which was one of the highest honors to receive. For the hardcore fight fans, this was the match everyone wanted to see. Donaire came in as a slight favorite. The fight was quite an eye opener for many as Donaire, who always had the speed advantage, is coming off as a slower fighter. And not only that, Rigondeaux was making Donaire miss a lot. Taking Donaire to school a bit here in these three rounds, these first three rounds so far. Sorry, 90 to 81, nine rounds to nothing, Guillermo Rigondeaux. Jim, this guy is terribly prepared, just terribly. I don't know if he hit a speed bag or what. The guy throws four or five punches and Donaire doesn't throw one. So I pointed out in a previous video how Regan Diaz just seems to mentally go in autopilot once he gets a lead, which did not go well, but it made it really entertaining. This situation was no different. Rigo had a sizable lead and Donaire closed in on him in the 10th round, dropping Guillermo. That woke him up and Rigo is now back to work. This time, he's really putting it on Donaire to end the fight off on top in the championship rounds. Whitaker put on a boxing masterpiece. This fight ending in the worst decision in boxing history as somehow it was scored a draw. To 115 a draw. The decision is a majority decision a draw. You can't have a list like this without mentioning an Ali fight. This is easily Ali's greatest performance before his career was put to a pause. Just poetry and motion. The way Ali evaded all of Foley's shots, the way he was circling the ring while landing counters on Foley, it was just beautiful. Ali knew of Foley and his reputation, and he had so much respect for the man that you didn't really see him showboat during the fight. He was serious as serious gets. Ali would stop Foley in the seventh round. People were wondering why I didn't include Mayweather versus Canelo in my top 10 Mayweather's easiest opponent list. It's the same reason why I didn't include the Mosley fight and Mayweather's toughest opponent list. It wasn't the easiest nor his hardest. Out of the list of easiest opponents Mayweather has faced, none of those 10 opponents made Floyd bite on a faint that hard or get effective shots in. Justin Junko was at number 10, and Harry Brusalis was at number 9. If you think Canelo did worse of a job than those guys who started the list, oh boy. That being said, not his easiest opponent, but he simply gave Canelo a boxing lesson of his lifetime. He fought an incredibly smart match, a beautiful offensive and defensive display against a young, athletic, in his prime opponent. As explained in the toughest Mayweather opponents video, when comparing Pretty Boy Floyd and Money Floyd, Pretty Boy Floyd took non-calculated risk without taking the consideration he may already be up on points that round. Money Floyd counted not only his shots that he threw and landed, but also his opponents. This fight here, it is beautifully displayed where, in one round, which the punch count was rather even, and Canelo had landed a shot that could have him up in that round. Floyd, knowing that because he had already tallied things up in his head, takes a calculated risk, lands enough on Canelo to outpoint and steal that round for himself. This is the ultimate checkmate here. He knows he stole the round from Canelo and immediately goes back on the defensive, refusing to let Canelo get anything else off that round. The level of ring intelligence here is unlooked massively. So Canelo receives his first and only loss in his career. In most cases, this would ruin a young fighter's career, but it did the opposite. And Canelo, who was inspired by Floyd, matured and improved his game to have a successful boxing career. This matchup really came out of nowhere, as many were expecting a potential lightweight unification against lineal champion Jorge Linares, 
we get a fight with Broner instead. This is Mikey's first fight at junior welterweight, and despite Broner's experience above lightweight, Mikey still came in the slight favorite to win over Broner. Broner was at plus 250. Despite those odds, Broner on paper was a force for the lightweight to deal with. Though Broner had the clear speed advantage, Mikey swept through him thanks to superb timing, consistently being first with his shots when Broner was being hesitant, but not overstaying his welcome to be countered. Great usage of effective aggression. Ultimately, Garcia was able to sweep Broner on the scorecards to win by a wide unanimous decision. Joshua learned from his mistakes from the last match with Ruiz, and that was not to fight a man with T-Rex arms in comparison despite having one of the longest reaches in heavyweight history on the inside. I don't think anyone took Joshua's words for it coming in camp for the rematch. Joshua stating he's going to fight like Ali. Well, it certainly was not like Ali, but he definitely outboxed and outclassed Ruiz to win by almost a shutout on the scorecards to regain the heavyweight titles. One of the biggest fights to end the 2020 year off, as it was on New Year's Eve. Kosei Tanaka was aiming to be one of the youngest and certainly the fastest to become a four division champion and his 16th pro bout and finally cracked the pound for pound rankings. Ioka, who is a former unified champion, four division champion and current WBO super flyweight champion, he as well is fighting for pound for pound, though he should have been in the rankings at one point in his career. Both guys, if they win, have plans unifying against the winner of Estrada Gonzalez 2 the following year. The fight was incredibly competitive, but there was one huge exploit in Tanaka's defense. He has had a bad habit of dropping both hands before leading with a shot, resulting for him to get hit. Yoko, who is a brilliant inside fighter, knew this right away, and the first real time this happened, Yoko drops Tanaka at the end of the fifth round. I can only assume Tanaka was told to keep his hands up, but if it was a bad habit, and if it was never corrected, that's simply not going to happen for him to correct it in the middle of the fight. Towards the final minute of the sixth round, Tanaka once again dropped by the same counter. Despite putting in great work in the seventh round, clearly winning it, unless he was able to hurt Yoka, you can just sense this happening again. And in the eighth round, around the same time in the sixth, Yoka catches Tanaka once again, and this time it was for good. The ref stopped the fight as Tanaka was out on his feet. <laughs> bastante más calmado mientras que Tanaka todos sus combates son frenéticos de principio a fin y se acabó Ioka successfully defends his title for the second time and as of a couple months ago finally enters ring magazine top 10 pound for pound to add on that was actually a brilliant stoppage by the ref because Tanaka had a great seventh round and the eighth was good as well you may say he was winning the eighth he stopped the fight soon as that punch landed and the ref literally had to catch him as he briefly lost consciousness This was Golovkin's pay-per-view debut against IBF middleweight champion David Lemieux. This was the first fight in a while viewers saw Golovkin put on a boxing clinic, displaying brilliant defense, evading all of David's shots. Gennady could not miss with the jab that night. That was the most effective weapon of the fight, completely taking David off his game. Golovkin would knock Lemieux down in the fifth round, and depending on how David reacted, it could have very well ended up as a disqualification. But luckily, it didn't, and Gennady, after more of a brilliant boxing display, ends up stopping Lemieux in the 8th round. 
И еще раз. Заставляет руки отпустить Левье сейчас. Опасно отвечает одним ударом Левье, но этого мало, конечно. Все. So Ray Mercer in his previous fight successfully defended his title against the favorite Tommy Morrison, knocking him out in the fifth round. Mercer's next mandatory opponent was undefeated Michael Moore. I'm only assuming since the fact that Holmes, who was 42 by the way, was on a five win streak after the Tyson fight and looked decent. He was offered more money to fight the old legend over fighting a former light heavyweight champion in his first title fight in the weight class. Mercer vacated the WBO title to fight Holmes. Holmes came in as a 4-1 underdog. Despite Mercer having his moments, the 42-year-old Holmes shocked everyone, outsmarting, out-hustling the younger, much stronger fighter round by round, reminding Mercer that he should have kept that belt and defended against Moore instead. Holmes will win by unanimous decision, though one judge had it close on the scorecards. Two of the judges scored at 117 for Holmes. As stated in the previous installment, the boxing media really likes to rule out Hopkins in a fight. Despite going on a long record-breaking spree of title defenses after beating the favorite Tito Trinidad, Hopkins will lose two highly contested fights against Jermaine Taylor. And now, according to the media, he's reduced to pre-Trinidad Hopkins and was ruled out having a chance against Antonio Tarver. Hopkins completely shuts out Tarver, becomes a light heavyweight champion, beats Winky Wright, loses an incredibly close decision to the great Joe Calzaghe, and right back to pre-Trinidad Hopkins media mindset coming into the Pavlik fight. Pavlik was a 4-1 to one favorite to win. At that time, I had only been watching boxing since mid to late 06. This was the first fight I saw live on stream where I saw a boxing lesson of this magnitude. Yeah, live stream. It existed back then. Back in those days, links were exchanged in the DMs of boxing forums, sometimes to a streaming website, mostly a specific address you had to use in a live stream program called Sopcast, clean 360 to 480p with no internet lag. Yep, those were the days before the clout chasing new generation throwing everything out there publicly, promoting live streams and ruining a great system for us school kids and less fortunate to enjoy some pay-per-view boxing. Oh, the, yeah, the, the fight. So yeah, once again, Hopkins shut out the boxing media and, and completely takes Pavlik to school to win by a wide, wide margin. One judge actually had Pavlik total 106 points. That will have to mean that Pavlik one round was outclassed so bad that the judge scored the round 10-8 in Hopkins' favor. He's still ripping Pavlik in domination and putting him on the defensive. Crowd loves it. Damaging blow to the image of the younger generation. After Tony's nail-biting rivalry against Mike McCallum, he moved up to super middleweight. He had one fight at super middle, and his next fight was against IBF super middleweight champion, Iran Barkley. Tony from the beginning, and Tony catches him inside with counter lefts and rights. Barkley trying to go to the body, Tony coming right up the middle, and James Tony is giving better than he's getting. This is the best James Tony one we'll see. If you wanted to show a friend who never seen a James Tony fight, this is the fight to show. 168 pound fight. There's a good right uppercut. Right hand, norm your leg. You saw the best of his offense and defense. Just so much talent from the 24 year old. Barkley was ultimately stopped in the ninth round. Just keep hitting on the punch. Catch this guy leaning and grab him. Good on James Tony. And the 32 don't look as good on Barkley. Left hooks from Tony. Barkley is stunned again. And Iran just can't defend himself against the as explained in one of my videos regarding this fight, the history of the super middleweight division up to that time was mainly ruled by fighters across the pond in Europe. You saw the best guys fighting the best that defined a whole decade. American media did not report it at all, just like the cruiserweight division. Downplay and underrate the fighters there when the US has no one at that time to bring forward to the table. When Jeff Lacey was coming along, Despite him just coming into the super middleweight scene, picking up a belt, he was immediately put on that pedestal. They was calling him the super middleweight Mike Tyson.
season, and the media was clowning the long reigning champ, Joe Calzaghe, not giving him a chance to win. It was an easy pick, and virtually, I would say 95% of the US media picked Jeff Lacey to win and expected him, fully expected him, to knock out Joe Calzaghe. Joe was actually injured just before the fight, and his dad reminded him how much he needs this fight, how much the media has belittled him, and this is his night to shut them up. Joe fought like a man possessed. We're talking about Hajime Noipo, green eyes possessed from round one to round 12. Lacey was being completely outclassed, and to top it off, Calzaghe knocks Lacey down for the first time in his career in round 12, and finishes the fight on the highest note. I was right, <laughs> with effing of course, you're right, I told you Joe, I told you Joe, and we kissed each other in on this list, we saw all levels of boxing lessons, but out of all of these, at least they looked like they had some sort of game plan. Birdo in the Mayweather fight, I've never seen someone so clueless what to do in the ring. Dude was like Ricky Bobby when he first got interviewed after winning, and was like, what do I do with these hands? I'm not sure what to do with my hands. Like, this dude did not know what to do with them hands. When watching Floyd fights live on TV is like watching Champions League football. You're watching the best play the best, and no matter how good one team is, you're always on high alert to expect the unexpected, no matter what the matchup is. Dang, with this fight, this is simply just league play against a team that's about to get regulated to another league. This fight was to set up the long anticipated LA unification with rival Fernando Vargas. This fight was for Javier Castellanos WBC junior middleweight title which he would be making his sixth title defense. This could have ended really bad for Oscar. According to a Japanese documentary of the career of Oscar De La Hoya, after the weigh into the fight, he decided to chill at the swimming pool. He ended up getting burned pretty bad by the sun and had suffered a heat stroke in the process. On fight day, he was cold but sweating and his legs felt weak at the same time. I got, I got a suntan, I got burned, and it so happened that I got a heat stroke. I remember coming down the tunnel into the fight I remember my leg, my legs just shaking. They were shaking because they were so weak. And so in my mind, I was saying, my gosh, I'm in trouble. This guy's gonna probably knock me out. But once the bell rings, once the bell rings, it's like something clicks. Despite the adversity coming in, Oscar would put on one of his greatest performances, completely shutting out Javier round after round. Biggest, strongest opponent he's ever fought. Technically brilliant performance, releasing punches correctly. Landing them well, offensively. Inside and inside. Those red trunks of Delaware have to and to top off such a great performance, he drops Javier in the final 10 seconds of the fight. Oscar will win by a wide margin of the scorecards to become a five division world champion. Something takes over your body, it's you just fight. And I remember I, I, I fought him with no problem. It was actually an easy fight. And I dropped him one time and I won the fight. So at that point, I was, uh, I was a champion in five divisions. I was... The long-awaited match between David Tua and the champion, Lennox Lewis. With Tua's aggression and the style like Mike Tyson, many were expecting Tua to really put up a great fight against Lewis and may pull off the upset. Though competitive early, once Lewis took rounds off to read Tua's offense, after the fourth round, it was a wrap for Tua and Lewis completely disabled Tua's offense. Round by round, sucking away Tua's confidence, eating him up with the jab and counters to where Tua was more reluctant to press the fight and create openings. This was met with boos and the usual American bias of trying to discredit a foreign champion's masterful performance against the highly ranked contender. Luckily, George Foreman stood up for Lewis and shut down such foolery. This is why he does not arouse the passions of boxing fans in the way that great heavyweight champions might hope to do. But if he's able to get that jab working, he can excite me. Don't take anything from Lennox Lewis tonight. He's winning this boxing match. Let the man win the fight. 
The weight is fine. Everything is fine. He's outboxing this kid. And he's about 30 what, Larry? 35, George. If Lennox Lewis was American, they would have said this man was an all-time great. He would have been chastised by the public for performances like these for not getting the KO. This is a lights out artistic performance by a heavyweight champion who for the moment looks impregnable. And please keep in mind, earlier that year, Lewis obliterated the massively overhyped American, Michael Grant, in two rounds. Grant receiving more overly positive media coverage despite his obvious flaws leading up to the Lewis fight compared to Lewis's whole 11-year career at that time. And the record for Lennox Lewis, 17 wins, no losses against an almost ludicrously weak list of opponents. See if he's going to pick his next opponent by committee, or who's going to pick the opponent? Well, you're right. He told us before that he was very enthusiastic about going ahead with top flight opponents, but that his business managers had to temper him. My interpretation of that was he wants to fight bums and they don't want him to fight anybody that good. <laughs> After all that, Lewis really made Tua look bad in the championship rounds to end the fight off and get the wide decision victory. This was Moore's fifth fight at heavyweight since moving up from light heavyweight, and he was up against 6'10", 275 pound Mike White. This was a brilliant performance by Michael Moore. Michael dropped White in the first minute of the fight, and White would barely make it out of the round. Everything but aggressive. Not even to proper size, but yeah. Moore has done the same though, George. He's saying, somebody get me out of here. Mike White is again in serious trouble at round one. In most cases where fighters would get that early knockdown, they have a lot of trouble trying to repeat it later in the fight as they spend too much time trying to recreate something that their opponent has already adjusted to. Through the great instructions by Emmanuel, Moore was able to remain calm and collective, beautifully setting up his shots to have White's number every single round. Now this is just an opinion, but I believe there was a betting fix with the referee. Moore came into the fight with 26 wins, all 26 by knockout. Now I don't know the betting odds, but for White, a guy where his last four losses, three in a row were by TKO, the betting odds for him to go to distance to a decision, win or lose, would be rather high by default. A rule that is mostly deactivated in fights is the fighter can be saved by the bell in the final round. There was numerous times that this fight should have been stopped and the ref let it be. It was so blatantly obvious that Emmanuel Stewart himself complained about the ref to Moore telling him you need to put on a sustained 30 second rally on him and get the stoppage. This is it though. It's ready to go now. That's what you gotta do. You just gotta sit down and set a sustained attack all the way through. For about 30 seconds of this over ref. And don't the ref rule really stop the fight. The man has been down so much now. Stewart once again telling him, coming into the final round, to knock him out despite Moore being way up on the scorecards. Remember that say by the bell rule that is rarely in effect? Well guess what, Moore knocks White out three seconds before the bell rung. is over. Absolutely right. Saved by the bell. No knockout. White is out, doesn't even come close to making it up before 10, but that doesn't even matter because of that rule, and this fight goes to a decision instead of being ruled a knockout. As stated in my Adrian Broner video, in the post Marcos Medina arc of Broner's career, this would be one of the best shows. Khabib was 19-1, his only loss was to Jesse Vargas, and which some believe Vargas had lost that fight. Dan Raphael having Khabib up two rounds. Despite the controversial loss, Khabib still held top 10 ranking by Ring Magazine, listed at number 9 in the world. 
Broner completely shuts down Khabib's relentless offense round by round. Something that has always been Broner's issues fight after fight was having consistent punch count and remaining active throughout the fight. That was not an issue and this performance was definitely a what could have been in the career of Broner. Broner would make a statement by not packing it up and going the extra mile of getting the 12th round TKO victory over Khabib. Nishioka was going through a renaissance in his career after moving up to the Super Bantamweight division, making one last run at the world class level to gain the WBC Super Bantamweight title in 2009. Just four years earlier, it looked like his career was at the end of the road after his sad performance against rival Vita Posaha Prom in their fourth fight to end their quadrilogy. I compared this in my When Fighters Turn Back the Clock video to Nonito Donaire's fight with Carl Frampton, how it definitely looked like it was the end of the road, moved down to a weight he's more comfortable at to completely revitalize it, taking the entire boxing world off guard. After three successful title defenses, Nishioka's opponent was against Commonwealth EBU champion and WBC mandatory challenger Rendell Monroe. Monroe built up a hell of a resume, defeating undefeated Kiko Martinez not once but twice contender Simone Maludrotu, and lastly Victor Terrazas to earn the mandatory position. Based on articles from the West, this Eastside Boxing article, when Monroe earned his title shot, they stated that Nishioka is in for a tough fight and he better get ready. Somewhat competitive early, Nishioka would put on one of his best performances of his career. <laughs> Even the Japanese commentators excitingly saying in English, this is your chance tonight. Nishioka was even willing to go toe to toe with Monroe, the bigger natural super bantamweight, to outpunch and beat him on the exchanges. <laughs> Despite up by a landslide, Nishioka would let his hands go and put on a great rally to try and get Moreau out of there in the final round. Nishioka would win 119-109 on all scorecards to solidify his status at Super Bantamweight as one of the best. So this is where the legend of the great Ricardo Lopez started. Against a Japanese boxing legend and now world-renowned boxing promoter, Hideyuki Ohashi. Before I start, there is nothing more I hate when doing research on two legendary fighters is the first list of results searching their names. You type in Jack Johnson and you get this Jack Johnson. Most boring, most bland music artist. And when searching up Ricardo Lopez, the first of many results you get is spanned with this guy. Who would have thought this guy would be more historically significant as this guy? Oh boy, where am I at now? Um, so Ricardo Lopez was just damn near unbeatable at straw weight. It's just wild how bad he picked apart the champ Ohashi. Now, I wish I included this in my previous video about the real life Hajime no Ippo moments, but this was definitely the equivalent of Ricardo Martinez versus Ippo. Lopez was just on several different atmospheres above him, and he would get the TKO win in the fifth round. <laughs>
this would be one of Roy's finest performances, landing over 50% of his shots to win by a shutout on the scorecards. 120-106 on all judges' scorecards. It don't get more lopsided than that. Roy will become the first undisputed champion at light heavyweight since Michael Spinks in 1985. One thing about this, Reggie is one of the best fighters in this weight class ever. He can't even know, he doesn't even know what to do. Johnson looking hesitant and confused as he trained hard, had a good plan, was mentally focused and prepared, and has simply been dazzled by Jones's overwhelming physical gifts. Seldom you see a guy get to this stage at one. Jason Sosa came on the scene as a real player in the division, fighting an undefeated Nicholas Walters to a draw. Many had thought he had won, that fight being labeled as the worst scored fight of 2015. But the powers to be was trying to make a Walters versus Lomachenko fight happen, and Sosa, despite showing his worth, was just in the way. Sosa Sosa's next fight would upset undefeated WBA regular champion Javier Fortuna stopping him in the 11th round. After a win overseas, this would set up a fight against Fasil. Since Sosa was the WBA regular champion and Jezreel Corrales was the super champion after he had dethroned Takashi Uchiyama, that would mean this fight between Lomachenko and Sosa can't be a unification. More to reasons why I say it's just a glorified interim belt. Hilariously, in the box rec notes, Sosa had to relinquish the title in order to fight Lomachenko because the WBO did not recognize the regular title as a title, simply and literally to where the fight was ultimately stopped in the ninth round. This was just bad. This was really, really bad for David Lemieux. If I were to compare this to another shutout performance, it would be Mayweather vs. Birdo. Lemieux literally couldn't have been any more lost in this fight from the opening bell and on. It was a bit of a shocker because Saunders didn't even look good his last two fights prior to the Lemieux fight, and he really fooled many on his HBO debut. This fight was in David's backyard of Canada, and hilariously out of all three judges, the only Canadian judge on the roster scored it the most lopsided. 120 108. Somehow the neutral country judges found two to three rounds to give to David, which is a real head scratcher. Homeboy didn't win a single round. So the final two fights that are on the list are some of the worst game plans I've personally seen play out that just happened to take place in the same year. I'm not showing the footage to this fight. Sorry, I'm not trying to get canned. Whack. Anyways, George Cambosos thought it was a smart idea to try and beat the master boxer at his own game rather than be the aggressor and make the fight as rough as possible. I'm almost positive that's what everyone tuning in was expecting to see. I'm pretty sure Haney couldn't believe it himself and just went to town fighting at his own pace, out punching, out landing to cruise to a unanimous decision win to become the undisputed lightweight champion. So Canelo really started this back in 2018 in the rematch against Gennady Golovkin and would come into the fight using a copy of the same game plan for the Rocky, Kovalev, Smith, Yildren, Saunders, and Plant fight, which there is nothing wrong with that unless you are adding more depth to it to keep your opponents guessing. So pretty much Canelo adopted Rocky Marciano's tactic of beating a fighter's guard till the defense will eventually open due to their weakened arms. Rocky put in away many guys using this method, leaving his opponent's elbows, shoulders, forearms battered, in some cases broken requiring surgery. For Canelo, this method was most effective against Callum Smith. When it comes to boxing ability and athleticism, Bevel is no Callum Smith, but due to the insane amount of hype because of Canelo's amazing accomplishments, many slept on Bevel despite being seen as the best fighter at light heavyweight. In the undercard, Dimitri Bevel takes on Isaac Chalemba uh, for Dimitri Bevel's light heavyweight title. I mean, Bevel for 13 fights, 11 knockouts, he's a tremendous puncher. Very, very good prospect. And even crowned on his HBO debut to do so years ago. You're number one in light heavyweight, man. I think, I think you take everybody out at the top. He's gonna be like a special attraction of boxing. I know that this is just the beginning. So it's wild that no one knew who this man was 
and threw him in the same boat as the Yildrim. Beevil has the slickness, the footwork, and the awkwardness of a Sergei Kovalev, but he's younger and much faster. If Sergei gave Canelo all he can handle before he hit the wall and got tired late in the fight due to Canelo's one-dimensional game plan, this is a failure in the makings if proper adjustments aren't made, because Beevil is going to be 100% ready and prepared for Canelo's tactics as he fought the same way against the physically bigger guy. I ran a poll just days before the fight, and out of all the polls I ran, this single-handedly being the most lopsided. I screenshotted this before many flocked back on the post to change their predictions, and Beevil's win percentage had shot up by double digits. So what happened on fight day? Beevil did exactly what was expected, and Canelo came in with one plan and not a backup, and it really showed. Beevil was expecting Canelo to try and beat his guard, and despite having clearly visible marks from them, that, he adjusted to mostly disable Canelo's offense and frustrate him round by round, outlanding Canelo. For Canelo to win the round, he will have to land here and there and outthrow him by a large sum, which that wasn't the case at all. Bevo was landing at a way higher percentage and outthrowing Canelo. The ultimate checkmate was when Bevo clearly taking the round away from Canelo. Canelo knows he's down on the round just a bit, but he can't get to him, so he tries to bait him in and get him to press forward. Beevil obviously not going to bite on that desperate attempt and continues to stick to the game plan of, of boxing and using effective aggression when necessary. Beevil would win by a close unanimous decision. The scorecards don't really reflect of the performance Beevil gave shutting out Canelo. Yes, you do have your swing rounds early in the fight, maybe in the middle if you're generous. 118-110 and 117-111 is the most appropriate. In future campaigns at super middleweight against natural super middleweights and light heavyweights, hopefully Canelo comes up with better ways of dealing with opponents like Beevil.